All right. Well, once again, I want to thank you for joining us today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Lori Beck, and I'm the President and Chief Operating Officer of Insurance Network America. Insurance Network is a managing general agency out of Boise, Idaho, and we have been working in the employer market for over 25 years. We are not a PAPACA expert. We don't hold ourselves out to be an attorney firm. We don't hold ourselves out to be a tax firm. We simply know that we've got agents out there who have employers with questions, and we know you're trying desperately to get in front of them and help them. So we provide this to you as a service. We do everything in our power to make sure that it's accurate, and we hope that you find the information to be helpful today. So we'll get this screen to start moving, and we will get going. Here we go. All right, so usually I always start with a pretty long speech about this um, little screen here, a graph of all of the government agencies and new rules and new regulations and everything that has to do with PAPACA. But today I wanted to talk a little bit different and show you what I looked like last night. This is what it's really like. I mean, we go back and we can look at this big chart and talk all day long about how complicated it is. And, you know, the problem is this is what it looks like when you're trying to decode all of this. And I think it's important to understand if you're getting confused and you're getting confused information or, you know, we're telling you something and then the next day we realize there's been a change, first of all, I apologize to you for any time that happens. But more importantly, I just want you to understand why it happens. This law, as you know, is complicated. And I'll give you a great example of this. We needed to really understand how the 90-day waiting period applies in the rules. So I wanted to make sure that we cover the slide on that today and you understand how the waiting periods work under PAPACA starting in January, you would know what it meant. So I went out and I pulled the most recent regulations that came out from our Internal Revenue Service on the 90-day waiting period. The regulations that were um, released are 89 pages long, 89 pages to cover a 90-day waiting period. So in the whole laws like this, sometimes I'll be looking to try to explain and understand how one thing works, and that particular regulation will take the IRS 144 pages to explain. So that's my disclaimer. My disclaimer is I'm going to do my best to go through all of this for you because here's the problem. It is coming at us at lightning speed. We have got to know it now. Our groups have got to know it now. Our clients have to understand it now. And nobody is out there adequately explaining to your clients what all of this means to them. So what I'm going to do today is to do my best to decipher this despite the fact that so many rules are yet to be written. And those that have been written, many of them have been yet to been gone through and explored and explained for any type of, you know, confusion or miscommunication that might be contained in there. So today what we're going to try to cover is the employer mandate, the payer play, the employer responsibility rules. We're going to talk about which employers it applies to. We're going to talk about which employees it applies to. Who must be counted when it comes to determining whether or not an employer is subject to the mandate? And then who must be covered once you've determined that they are? Plan design. What do you have to do with respect to a plan design? Because it is different than what a small employer has to do. And then also, what is the penalty? How will it be calculated? And how will it be collected? Now, here's the basic rule. The IRS has stated that beginning January 1st, 2014, regardless of when a plans or a group's plan year is, any employer who in the previous calendar year averaged 50 or more full-time employees or full-time equivalent employees will be subject to the law and must provide coverage to all full-time employees, which are those who are expected to work 30 hours a week or more. Now, a full-time equivalent employee is an employee whose hours, a group of employees whose hours when totaled together equal at least 120 hours a month. Interestingly, I saw some new rules coming out as it relates to full-time employees and who must be covered, where the government is now talking about 120 hours per month. But really, as you go through it, you'll see that the rule really boils down to 30 hours a week on average. <clears throat> 
Now, there is a tradition relief in here, and this has to do with those groups who have a fiscal year or a plan year other than a calendar year. And what the IRS said on that, and it's a bit confusing as well, what the IRS said on that is the rule still applies to you January 1st, 2014. However, if you have some employees who would be eligible participate in, to participate in the plan as of December 27th, 2012, and you have a fiscal plan year, you would not be subject to any penalty for that employee if you excluded them or if the plan were determined to be not meeting the standards until the first day of the fiscal plan year beginning in 2014. So let me try to make sure I say that again in something that might make more sense. Let's say your plan year is June 1st through May 31st of every year. And let's just say that you are later determined to have employees that you are subject to a penalty for. For the first six months of the year, you would not have to pay a penalty. I guess actually, I'm sorry, first five months of the year you would not have to pay a penalty for those employees. The penalty would kick in June 1st to coincide with your um, fiscal plan year if you did not then subsequently offer them coverage. And I hope that makes sense um, because it only gets more complicated from there. So what do we have to do? If an employer is determined to be a 50 plus employee, in other words, somebody who is subject to the law, this is the rule. Now, I want to tell you that you need to remember that the federal government has repeatedly said there is no mandate that any employer offer coverage to any employee. However, if they choose to not offer affordable coverage that meets minimum level of coverage to their full-time employees, they may be subject to what is called an employer shared responsibility payment. In other words, a tax. Now, the only way an employer is ever going to have to pay that tax is if one or more of their full-time employees goes out to an exchange, qualifies for, and receives a premium tax credit. So I guess the good news is, is if you don't offer a plan or the plan doesn't meet the affordable or minimum um, requirements, which we'll go into in a minute, there is no penalty unless one of your employees goes out, applies for, qualifies for, and receives a premium tax credit. I do want to point out something briefly that I think is important to discuss. We're going to be talking about the impact on plans in this session, but we're going to be talking to them specifically as they relate to the employer responsibility provisions. In other words, pay or play mandate. Now, the problem is that in the law, the law defines a small group as 1 to 100 full-time equivalent employees. They also say that the states are allowed to limit that to 1 to 50 if they so choose to in the exchange until 2016. The question that hasn't been answered yet and the questions that the IRS has pro promised to provide us some guidance on is what do we do with respect to plan design requirements for groups between 50 and 100? Because there are specific requirements about what the plans must do, what they must look like, how they must cover things in the small group market that do not apply to the large group market. And when you have a, a, a law that on one hand defines large employer under one set of definitions and another side offers it on a different set of definitions, I think we have to recognize that that becomes a challenge for everyone. And it's critical that you keep an eye on this and we'll continue to try to send you out information as we learn more and as the IRS and the administration release the rules. Something else that has come up a lot that I think you really need to understand is how controlled groups and affiliated companies work. And you need to understand that control groups and affiliated companies have been part of the regulations in the IRS Internal Revenue Code forever. Basically, according to PAPACA, all employees in a controlled group are combined to determine if an employer is subject to the mandate. But each individual company would be responsible for offering the coverage or paying the penalty. 
So what I mean by that is, let's just say you have a daycare. And that daycare is, has 30 full-time equivalent employees. And you also own a car wash. And your car wash has 20 full-time equivalent employees. So as an owner, you've got one company, completely separate industry, with 30 full-time equivalents, another with 20 full-time equivalents. The law states you must add those full-time equivalents together. And in that case, you are going to be subject to the employer shared responsibility rules. But each of those companies would then individually be responsible for offering a plan that meets the requirements or paying the penalty if they choose not to. So if the car wash offers a plan and it meets the requirements, great. If the daycare does not offer a plan, they would be subject to the penalties. When we get into the penalties and how they're calculated, I think you're going to see that in this kind of an instance, because of the fact that you can um, eliminate some of the employees from the calculation, it may be a mute point. I just wanted to use that as an example so that you would understand you do have to be subject to the rules and you are going to have to take a look at how the requirements work. Again, I want to remind you if you have questions about any of this, please type in your questions to the side. I'm going to try to get to some of these and explain some of these things we're talking about in better detail shortly. But in the meantime, I do also want to give you the option of typing in the questions to the side. OK. So what we know, sorry about that. So what we know is that we have to determine within each employer if they have 50 full-time equivalent employees. So the question then becomes, which employees do you count? Well, the law talks a lot about this term, common law employee. And a common law employee is basically anyone that you're dictating when they must work, how they must work, and what their job performance must look like. Um, employees you can exclude are independent contractors. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Sole proprietors, partners in a partnership, 2% shareholders in an S-corp, leased employees, and oversee employees. You must, however, count foreign workers that work in US operations. So basically what you're looking at there is if the payroll is paid in the United States, then you must count those people when you start counting the hours. I'm going to circle back up to a couple of things. Independent contractors. I just described for you what a common law employee looks like. You, just, you tell them when to work, where to work, how to work. So please don't advise your groups that they should simply put all of their employees on a 1099 basis, consider them to be independent contractors, and they're going to get out of this regulation, because that is not true. Um, there have been a couple of rulings come down by the IRS warning uh, groups about trying to do that. It isn't going to work in most cases. I also want to talk really quickly about leased employees. And while we're doing that, Let's talk about a few different other kinds of employees. What about a commission-only person? Well, commission-only person, the law specifically says you must count their hours as hours worked, including any travel time. So be careful saying, I don't have to worry about them because I don't pay them a base salary. I'm only paying them commissions. Now, again, we're going to get into in a minute whether or not you actually have to offer them coverage. Not talking about that now. All we're talking about is how do you determine whether or not you are subject to the rules and even have to care about who you would have to offer coverage. Leased employees. It is stated in the regulations that in most cases, leased employees are expected to be considered the common law employees of the leasing company. Now, I will tell you I've been into some pretty good disagreements with owners of PEOs, leasing companies. And this is an area where what I've heard from them is, look, take a look at what they say about affiliated companies and common ownership. Even though you count the, all the employees of the leasing company as one, it is the individual employer groups that we have leased the employees of that will be responsible for the employer mandate. Well, I think that is still up in the air because the difference is, who is issuing the W-2? 
in the daycare and in the, the car wash example I gave you, the daycare is going to be issuing W-2s to those folks, and the car wash is going to be issuing W-2s to those folks. In a leased situation, it is the leasing company that is going to be issuing W-2s to those employer groups. Now, it doesn't mean that the employers and the PEO won't reach an agreement that says, look, little employer, you're going to have to be the one responsible for offering coverage or paying the penalty, and we're going to send you a bill. But I still believe that the onus is going to fall on the leasing company. I'm sure we're going to see some additional rules come out on that, and we'll keep an eye out on them for you. Temporary employees. If employed directly by the employer, you must count them. So if as insurance network, we decide we need to bring in five new employees on a temporary basis, and we tell them, look, you know, you're only going to work for us for the next 45 days because we've got to get through this big project, you must count them. Now, again, we'll talk later about how it works with respect to um, some seasonal employees, and that's a little bit different. We'll also talk a little bit more about whether or not you have to cover those folks. But when it comes to counting hours to determine full-time equivalents, the law is very clear. You do have to count all temporary employees' hours. Student or an intern must be counted. Even if the intern is unpaid, there appears to be some ambiguity. There seems to be some confusion in the law as to whether or not you have to count them. And I'll explain a little bit more about that now. But to be safe, I would say you probably want to take a look at counting unpaid interns. And then you can come back in and get some clarification if it turns out that that intern would be the difference between being subject to the rules and not being subject to the rules. Union employees, this is a biggie. If I'm an employer and I've got a subset of my group that is union and another subset of my group that is not, when it comes to determining employer size, I have to count those union employees even if they're covered under a union plan. So again, I know I keep saying this, but I think it's important to understand. I am not saying you have to cover any of the people on the screen. I'm simply saying that when you're adding up your full-time equivalent employees, you have to cover, you have to include these people's hours in the calculations talk a little bit briefly about the seasonal employees because I want to remind you a seasonal employee is different than a temporary employee. I also want you to understand that in PAPACA, if you read all 2,700 pages of this bill, throw in the Reconciliation Act, and then go look at some of the additional regulations coming out of the government, the only time they use the term seasonal employee is in the context of whether or not an employer meets the definition of an applicable large employer. Therefore, you must count them. Now, if these seasonal employees push your number of full-time equivalents to over 50 for four or fewer months during the year, it's possible you may still not be subject to the mandate. So you need to count them, but then later there may be a way that you could get out of it if it turned out that they threw you over the top. I'm going to explain that to you and show you a little graph in a few minutes, and hopefully that will help it make more sense. Okay, so now that you know whose hours you have to count, let's talk again for just a couple of minutes about which hours you count. Basically, any employee who an employer reasonably believes will work an average of 100, or I'm sorry, 30 hours a week or more should automatically be considered full-time, regardless of actual hours worked. Now, there are some creative rules that exist for non-hourly employees. I will tell you, they may not be worth the risk. So if you decide to use some of these creative rules, I just warn you that if the IRS comes in and, you're, and has assessed you a penalty, and you're trying to debate the penalty, you better have some consistent rules in place and you better be able to prove that this creative rule wasn't strictly designed in order to avoid the mandate. I'll give you an example of that. One of the rules states that for a non-hourly employee, you could use a method of counting hours which would credit an employee for eight hours of work for every day that the person was paid for at least one hour of work or vacation or holiday. <laughs> 
And you can apply that rule as long as you do it consistently for all of your non-hourly employees working in the same location. So let's say, for example, you're an employer who has employees who work three tens. They come in, they only work three days a week, and those are three 10-hour shifts. You could use that rule and say, okay, for every day that they work at least one hour, we're going to just consider that to be eight hours of work. So for the purpose of determining employer size, that would be 24 hours a week that you would throw into your calculations. Could work, might work, might be tricky. So again, there are some creative rules in there. My honest advice to you to give to your employers just to keep them out of trouble is if they're working 30 hours a week, consider them to be full-time. Even if every once in a while they fluctuate down a little bit, consider them to be full-time employees and keep yourself out of some hot water. Now, hourly employees are easier. There are no such creative rules for hourly employees. And in fact, you have to treat paid hours as hours worked. So that means paid leave, paid vacation, paid holidays, as well as actual hours worked, all are counted. Additionally, there is a rule in here that talks about military duty. So military duty would be, you know, they go off for two weeks to the guard. It could be that they're deployed. And if they would normally be a full-time 30-hour-a-week employee, you're going to have to count what those hours would have been. Now, there are a couple of little things in here that may come into play, especially for these employers, such as FMLA. What do you do during FMLA? If an employee is off for FMLA, it appears at this point that if it is unpaid time, you would not count those hours. If it is paid time, as indicated here, you would have to count those hours. So I know we've covered a lot of this in the previous one, so we'll go over this just really briefly. A full-time equivalent, again, is one or more employees whose hours, when added together, equal one full-time employee. So you've got two employees that each work 15 hours a week. Added together, they make 30. They are a full-time employee equivalent. Once you've done the math, the result, if it's not a whole number, is rounded to the le next lowest number, so it's rounded down. If your math results in 17.8, that employer would have 17 full-time equivalents. So let me just show you some quick, easy math. Let's just say you've got an employer who has 30 employees who each work 30 hours a week. He's got 60 employees who each work 10 hours a week. Pretty easy on the 30 times 30 is 900. 60 times 10 is 600, 1,500 total hours per week, divided it by 30, you have 50 full-time equivalent employees for that month. Well, why is that month important? Well, that's because the rules state that you determine each year whether or not the law will apply to you next year based on your average full-time employment, or full-time equivalents, I should say, during the previous year. I want you to know a couple of things here really quickly. One is, once it's been determined, once I go through and I'm at the end of the year and I've determined that I am subject to the law for all of 2014, I am subject to the law for all of 2014, even if I subsequently reduce my hours to a lower number across the board. I'm still subject to the law or number of employees. If I grow, if I am somebody who determines that in 2013 I have fewer than 50 full-time equivalents, I am not subject to the law, and then in 2014 I grow, I wouldn't be subject to the law until 2015. So here's what I would suggest that you take a look at. Because in 2013 we can use an average I would have your employers start doing something like this now. I would have them month by month writing in how many of those full-time employees they have. And then for those that aren't working a consistent full-time average 30 hours, I would do the full-time equivalent math, add them together month by month. Now, in most years, 
it's always going to be the average over the course of the year is going to determine it. So in this particular case, even though there were months towards the end where I had more than 50 employees, full-time equivalents, my average throughout the year is only 45, not subject to the law in 2014. Hopefully that makes sense. More importantly, perhaps, is that let's just say in this particular example, I had a higher than average over the 12 months. My average turned out to be 52. The law does state that for 2013 only, an employer may use any six or more consecutive months he chooses this year to determine his applicability to next year. So if I've got seven months of this year that are all consecutive and are all under 50, I could document that, put it in my file, and if something came out next year, show that to the IRS and prove that I met the requirement for being a quote-unquote small employer for Employer Responsibility Act provisions in 2013, therefore not subject in 2014. Now, if you're dealing with an employer who has seasonal employment issues, so you've got somebody out there who is a golf course or a Christmas tree sales or they are another type of business that seasonally ends up having very high employment but over the course of the year would not otherwise be subject to the, to the rules, this is how it works. The law states that if, if you have more than 50 full-time equivalents, less than four months a year, even if those four months are not consecutive, the law would not apply to you as long as those who were employed for those four months the ones who cause you to go over 50 are seasonal employees. So I want to be clear about that again. You couldn't just say, you know, my full-time employees are like at, I don't know, 49, and then I hired a couple of extra people here and a couple of extra people there, and, you know, I seasonally had, it, had more than um, 50 employees, but only for four times. That's not the way the law reads. The law specifically states that as long as the employees who kicked you over the 50 for those four months are the seasonal employees you hired, then you could consider yourself to not be subject to the law. So be a little bit careful of that, especially in the go-forward years. Remember, as we discussed in the 2013 years, you can pick the six months you want to choose but be aware of how the seasonal employees work. I hope that's not confusing. Um, as I showed you before, so much of this, so much of the challenge of putting these webinars together is not just going through about 42 inches worth of paper and trying to decipher it all and make sure that nothing changed since yesterday, but a lot of it is trying to figure out when I'm doing the webinars how to put it in some semblance of order that makes sense. So if I'm not making sense and you have additional questions, remember we spend a lot of time training our staff here on how this works. So if you have specific questions, reach out to them. Reach out to Mike Dibbon, who runs that division. Reach out to me, and we'll do our best to help you. Bottom line is, let's just assume that you have discovered, after all of the math and all of the calculations, that an employer is subject to the employer shared responsibility provisions of PAPACA. The question then becomes, who must be offered coverage? And the way the rule works is that if you're subject to the rules, the employer must offer coverage, which meets the affordable minimum essential requirements to at least 95% of its full-time employees. Now, not everybody is aware of this, but if the group doesn't currently have a plan offering dependent coverage, then they could actually, in 2014, continue to not offer any dependent coverage. And then in 2015, the rules include they must cover dependent children. Interestingly, nothing in PAPACA requires an employer to offer coverage to spouses. Found that very interesting in the rules. Um, but 
If they do not offer coverage to at least 95% of their full-time employees, they may be subject to possible penalties. Now, interestingly, this 95% thing came out fairly recently. And the law doesn't explain exactly how the employer could choose which 5% of the employees he would exclude. But given the anti-discrimination rules that have been changed and added and modified within PAPACA, I think the final regulations on this will be interesting. They haven't been written yet. We're waiting to see them. So um, I'd like to know who you could exclude. I'm guessing the people you can exclude are your highly compensated employees. Um, that's just a guess based on some of the other provisions of the law. So who must you offer coverage? Well, employees who average 30 hours a week or more during a month must be offered coverage. And yes, I did just say during a month, which means that technically under the law, I could offer you coverage in January, drop your coverage in February, offer you coverage in March, and not be subject to a penalty. Don't recommend you do that, but that is the way the law is written. Now, employees with a stable work schedule require a waiting period that may not exceed 90 calendar days from the date of full-time status to the date of coverage. So this is the thing I told you I went through and, and it was 89 pages long and it was very confusing and a bit convoluted. Um, the thing I would want you to understand about that is it's calendar days from date of full-time status to date of coverage. So you could have somebody who is eligible for coverage on Saturday the 14th. You would have to backdate that to Friday the 12th in order to not be in trouble with the law. Um, employers with variable hour employees, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, do have some flexibility for determining when and if they must be covered. I told you before that there's no language that talks about seasonal employees in the who must be covered but they do talk specifically about variable hour employees, and so we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Let me just walk through this 90-day waiting period again, and I'm not going to spend 89 pages or 89 minutes on this, but here's what you need to know. It is calendar days, including weekends and holidays. The plan must be amended to include this reduced waiting period on the plan's renewal in 2014, and our suggestion to you would be that your employers adopt a first of the month following a 60-day waiting period. In these 89 pages, they address the fact that they understand that employers usually use calendar months rather than a date number of days measurement. And they follow that by saying the law doesn't allow for us to change that to calendar month. The law requires that we use 90 consecutive days. Because it requires 90 consecutive days, that also must mean calendar days, including weekends and holidays. The other thing that the law says is that you, it talked about the fact that a lot of people in the comment period talked about, but most plans say after you meet the waiting period, you then are subject to eligibility for coverage on the first of the month following meeting the waiting period. The regulations in those 89 wonderful pages also make it very clear that that is not acceptable, and that you must, in fact, offer them coverage. They must be on the plan no later than the 91st day. So my suggestion to you is that you advise your employers to adopt a first of the month following a 60-day waiting period. Now, I played around with this a little bit last night. And when I did, I actually found a couple of instances where that would still get you into trouble. When you start dealing with months that have more than 31 days in them and they're consecutive, it could create some issues. So what my suggestion to you is, you just watch this closely. You may end up in a situation where an employer is going to have to give somebody even a shorter waiting period unless they want to start offering middle of the month effective dates to their employees. They could do that if they can get their plan sponsor, the carrier, to do it. OK, so this is a busy slide, and I know it, but I needed to kind of cover this, because here is where I believe a lot of confusion is coming in. 
And one of the things that I'm getting confused often with people I talk to is they believe that these measurement periods and stable stability periods that I'm about to talk about have anything to do with counting employees for determining if you're subject to the rules. And I'm going to tell you, they don't. These rules, these stability and eligibility, these look back periods, only relate to whether or not you have to offer coverage to an employee. So here's how it works. Bottom line is that if you have an employee who has fluctuating hours, who may not always work 30 or more hours a week, you can determine an for your existing employees a couple of standard measurement periods, a couple of different ways that you could determine and actually delay adding them to the plan to make sure that they actually do meet the requirements. Here's how it works. The employer must establish a measurement period in advance. That measurement period can be anywhere between 3 and 12 months. Following the the measurement period, the employer must establish a stability period, which must be at least as long as the measurement period, no less than six months, and cannot exceed 12 months. It must be consistent dates for each class of employees. So you couldn't say for, you know, this employee I'm going to have this measurement period, and for that employee I'm going to have a different one. By classes of employees, you must have consistent measurement periods and stability periods. And you absolutely have to have a documented system for recording this information because if one of the employees that you're not covering during this period of time applies for a subsidy, receives the premium tax credit, and you are assessed a penalty as an employer, you're going to want to be able to prove that you had a consistent policy in place and that you are not subject to a penalty for that person. Now, I get that's complicated, so I'm going to give you an example. And I wish that my example, I felt, made it any more clear. I think it's still very confusing, but hopefully this will help it make a little bit more sense. Let's say that for current, and again, this particular part of it, we're only talking about current employees, which in the law is referred to as an ongoing employee. Let's just say as an employer, you choose a standard measurement period of July through December, and then a stability period of January through June. So six months, six months, we meet the requirement. Um, and then let's just say that we look at a particular employee's hours per week. And in July of 13, during the standard measurement period, he averaged 29 per week. In August, 30 per week. In September, 28 per week in October 28 per week, November 26, December 33. Overall, during the measurement period, this employee averaged 29 hours. This employer would not have to offer coverage to the employee during the stability period. So even though the employee, as you can see, in December was a 33-hour-a-week employee, even if that employee later becomes a solidly average 30 plus hour a week employee, during the stability period, the employer can not offer him coverage and would not be subject to a penalty during that period of time. But let's look at that. Let's look at the same employee and let's go to the next year. The next year, I lost my slide. Hold on. Here we go. Sorry about that. I've got a couple out of order here. So the next year, the stability period would still be six months, six months. So now it switches to standard measurement period, 1-1 of 14 through 630. And then the stability period would be the second six months. That same employee that had 29 hours during the previous measurement period, who is not being offered coverage in the first six months of 2014, now shows these hours. You can see that over that six-month period, he's now at 31.5. So the employer must offer this employee coverage during the stability period of July through December of 2014, 
even if his employee hours subsequently drop off to 20 hours a week, the employee would still be subject to the mandate and he would still have to be offered coverage. Don't shoot the messenger. I didn't write this. Now, go back to my slide that I had out of order. The rules I just talked to you about have to do with ongoing employees, people already on the payroll, people that already work there. For new employees, the rules work like this. If the employee is expected to average 30 hours a week, the employer is expected to offer coverage following the 90-day waiting period. So you don't want to play any games of bringing somebody in that you know darn well is going to be working 30 plus hours a week and say, I'm going to apply all of these initial measurement periods. You've got to be very careful about that. But if the employee is expected to be a variable hour employee and is not expected that that employee would average 30 hours a week, the employer may impose similar measurements. These are called initial measurement periods, and those initial measurement periods can actually be up to 12 months, during which time you would manage and modify and watch how the employee's hours are calculating out month by month by month, and then determine whether or not they're subject to the rules and therefore should be offered coverage. One thing I will tell you is if you find that a variable hour employee over that 12 initial month measurement period is determined to be a 30 hour a week employee, you may not then impose a 90 day wait. The rule states that for that employee you must get them on your plan within the, their 13th month of employment. So you're going to have to get them on the plan pretty quick. All right. So now we've talked about who we must offer coverage to. So now we know we're subject to the rule. We know who we must offer coverage to. Now we've got to talk about what the plan must look like. Remember I told you that if they offer a plan, it must not only be offered to all full-time employees who are eligible, it must also be offered in an affordable way, and it must meet minimum values. So let's talk about affordability rules first. To be considered affordable, what the rule says, the law states, is that an employee is expected to pay no more than 9.5% of his household income on his portion of self-only coverage offered by his employer. A lot of employers pushed back on this and said, how the heck are we supposed to know what the household income is? Also, this is pretty discriminatory. You're saying we're going to have to offer coverage at a much higher level for our employees who have families than we are for our employees that don't. And the rule came back, safe harbor, that stated that an employer may use the employee's box one of their W-2 income as the household income measurement. And that is really their gross wages. Before you take into consideration anything that might have been run through a 125 or any other types of deductions like 401k or a simple deduction. So it is box one on their W-2. Now, when the employee goes, if they go to the exchange, the rules are slightly different. There the rules are 9.5% of the household's MAGI, their modified adjusted gross income. So just like we talked about with the W-2, their net income, their taxable income may be lower because of deductions. There are also some above-the-line deductions that are taken into consideration when you look at somebody's modified adjusted gross income. So there is a slight chance that the employee's household MAGI will be less than the employee's Box 1 W-2 income. If that happens and the employee goes in and they are eligible for the subsidy because of that difference, they would get the premium tax credit, but the employer would not be subject to the penalty because his plan would be considered to be affordable. One of the things that was clarified very recently is that even on the exchanges to be affordable, it is the single only premium that's being used, not the household premium that's being used. And this has created a huge backlash from a lot of the organizations that thought that a lot of families out there were going to get help for coverage. And if their employer, if the husband or wife is working for an employer that's offering a quote-unquote affordable plan, 
they're not going to be eligible for that subsidy. And so there's still some additional regulations that are supposed to come out about how that's all going to play out and how it's all going to work. Um, but I do want you to be aware of the fact that that is a change out there. Now, to be a plan that offers minimum value, what the law states is that the plan must provide minimum value by covering at least 60% of the total allowed cost of benefits expected for an average person covered under the plan. Well, in the small group world, what they talk about when they talk about the bronze plan, which has to also meet the 60% actuarial value, the difference is the, the actuarial value is going to be based on that state's most commonly sold small group health plan. On the minimum value under the employer shared responsibility rules, the minimum value is actually based on a population of large employer groups. And so it will be a completely different calculation. It will be a completely different calculator. And the IRS has stated that they expect to deliver a minimum value calculator that will be very easy for employers to use. Um, and they expect it to be released where an employer would go in they would enter their deductible, how the co-pays work for doctor's office visits and drugs and all of those things, what the co-insurance is, the out-of-pocket is. They'll push a button and it'll kick back and it'll tell the employer whether or not the plan meets the minimum value rules according to the Employer Shared Responsibility Act. So we are still waiting for that calculator to be out. Again, it is not the same one that was released that calculates actuarial value. So I know that this webinar is, is running on 45 minutes or 50 minutes. I'm hurrying. I hope that um, I'm not taking you guys too long. I will get through the next few slides pretty quickly. So how does the penalty work? Well, the penalty is going to be assessed at the end of each calendar year after the employees have filed their federal tax return. So basically, April 15th will be about the time that the IRS is going to start calculating any penalties due to them based on an individual employer. They're going to calculate those penalties on a monthly basis. Then they're going to send the employer a notice of assessment requesting payment in full due immediately. Now, the employer will have a right to dispute this amount. And that's why, as we talked about through this webinar, record keeping will absolutely be critical to those employers. So what do they have to pay? Well, an employer who offers no coverage at all or doesn't offer coverage to 95% of his employees would be subject to a $2,000 per year, which is $167.67 per month, for every full-time employee minus the first 30 full-time employees. Do you remember that daycare we talked about in the beginning? Let's just say that daycare offered no coverage. That daycare is not going to have a penalty assessed even if their employees go out and get coverage, because they get to subtract the first 30 employees. Now, if the employer does offer coverage, but the coverage is determined to either be unaffordable or it doesn't meet minimum value, then the rule is that it's $250 per month, which calculates out to $3,000 per year, for every full-time employee who received a subsidy in the exchange or the same penalty is above $2,000 per year times every employee minus the first 30, whichever is less. So if you've got an employer who only has one employee go out and qualify for a subsidy because the plan was unaffordable or didn't meet minimum value, he's going to pay a $3,000 penalty. And I already told you that, so let me move to this one. So should an employer pay or play? You know, we have got some agents out there that are having very, very good success sitting down with employers and walking them through the calculations, talking about what if you offered a plan that meets the minimum value, and here's the premium for the self-only coverage, and what if you required all of your employees to pay 9.5% of their W-2 income towards the plan? you're only having to cover those who say yes. So it's not going to be a matter of you're going to have to cover all of them. If you offer them the coverage and they decline it, 
and yet it was affordable and it met minimum value, you're not subject to a penalty just because they chose not to take it. Things to understand as well is that the penalty, if you are assessed it, is not tax deductible. Therefore, the actual impact of the bottom line of the employer is much higher than the actual penalty. Whereas premiums who, for those who take the plan are tax deductible to the employer, and the premiums the employees pay are also tax deductible to the employee, and most likely not subject to payroll taxes, therefore also helping the employer out on his expenses. There are some calculators out there. We're working on developing one of our own that we could provide to you to give you some help that walk an employer through that. Over here, this is the premium. This is how many employees we expect would participate. This is what your outlay would be on a tax deductible basis. On the right-hand side, it shows what the penalty would be if you chose not to offer coverage, remembering that this is subject to tax, meaning it is an above the line. You've got to pay taxes on all those monies that you're spending on the penalty. And in many cases, what employers are seeing is that it is more affordable for them to offer coverage. That said, we also see a lot of employer groups, especially those with very high turnover industries, those that are in food service. You've seen, you've seen all of the restaurants coming out, the hotels coming out, saying we can't afford to offer all of our high turnover rate employees coverage. They are dropping their employees to 28 hours a week, and therefore, again, remember, not having to cover those people. So a lot of different things at play here, and I imagine you guys have a lot of questions. So I can't promise I can get to them all. I'm afraid to look at how many there are, and again, I do know that we have gone on for quite a while, so I'm hoping that you guys will bear with me as we get to these questions. And I do definitely apologize that it has taken um, me longer than I had hoped to run through all of this. So let me get those questions out here, and we will try to get to them. Okay, so how are employers going to assist in premium payments for employees who go to the exchanges? Um, you know, I'd like to address, Stephen, I'd like to address that question a little bit separately because there was a rule that just came out recently that, that is really going to hit some of these employers who are thinking about defined benefit plans pretty hard. What I read recently, and I assume that's what you're talking about, you're talking about perhaps setting up a health reimbursement arrangement, setting a certain dollar amount that an employee would be able to use for premium. They would use that premium to go out to the exchange and purchase an individual plan on the exchange. Um, the IRS just came back out, and they are deeming that HRAs are only, only going to be allowable if they... Um, if they are part of an integrated employer-sponsored plan. So if they're using that defined benefit plan to go out and buy a plan on the exchange, unfortunately, I think they're in a little bit of trouble. Um, let's see. OK, no more gender distinctions. Does that mean everyone, including men, will automatically have maternity coverage? How about older women past bearing age? You know, Sandy, that really relates back to some of the things we've been talking about with respect to mandates on um, individual plans and mandates on small group plans because really, frankly, these larger employers have always been subject to maternity rules. Maternity um, premium has always been kind of spread across the group. Anti-selection has been really minimized. and so. The, the real question is, how does that impact individual groups, and how does that impact small groups? And the answer to that is, yes, um, maternity coverage is going to be required on those groups. And in those cases, they are actually going to be um, paying premium, even though they are not eligible for the benefit. Let's see. How will carve-outs be handled in 2014? Lisa, that's a great question. Um, if you read the non-discrimination rules that came out in um, 2010 that have been kind of shelved for a little while, um, I would tell you that carve-outs are extremely, extremely dangerous, expensive, and problematic. Um, they're not a good thing. 
the only way an employer will be allowed to have a carve out in 2014 is if that plan is um, grandfathered. So a grandfathered plan will not be subject to a lot of the rules, including the carve out. Now, that said, if you have an employer subject to the Employer Responsibility Act, I still think you have some issues, and I can address those online. It'll it'll take a little bit longer um, to get to it. Oh my goodness, we've got a lot of questions. Okay, um, in the small group definition, does that mean 100 full time or 100 full time equivalent? Everything as it defines group size in Papaka uses the term full time equivalent. They do use that term a little bit differently in a couple of areas, but it is always full time equivalent. Um, will a large group be penalized if they do not offer their offer insurance to their employees before 1114? No, John, they don't have to offer coverage to them this year, but they will be penalized if they don't start offering them coverage in 2014. Um, how do we deal with PEOs as competitors? Small groups might find it attractive. Um, Nick, I, I disagree. I think that there are going to be some issues with PEOs that we have not yet um, addressed at this point. Okay, trying to find the ones that I can answer pretty quickly. Um, somebody here talks about you need to divide full-time equivalent by 120, not by 30. Um, Jason, you're right in some regards, and I will tell you there's actually one out there that talks about 130, but at the bottom line, at the end of the day, what the law talks about is an average of 30 per week. And so um, you are correct when you start doing the math, you divide it by 120. Um, we've covered that in a couple of the other webinars that we've done. But ultimately, you would end up with um, the same math. Okay. All right, we are now right up under the one hour mark and I have to apologize because we've got about 80 additional questions in here. So here's what I'm gonna do for you. We are going to reach out to those of you that have questions on here. We will get the answers out to you the best that we can. We'll provide you subsequent documentation. As always, I usually have people who disagree with some of the points that I have in here. I'm gonna say to you, you might be right. Um, I do my absolute best to make sure that I check at least three sources before I give you any information. And that's one of the reasons that it takes so many hours to research this information before I put it out to you. That said, even checking at least three sources before I give you the information, things change, there's new interpretations. Every single day something new is coming out. I believe we got three out this week alone. So when I get somebody that says, I don't think you're right, what I always do is go back, double check it, research it. If, I, if it turns out you're wrong, I'll talk to you and show you why I disagree. If it turns out you're right, I'll send out something to everybody that was on the webinar explaining to you that I was wrong and explaining to you what the rule really means. So I wish I could tell you I'd never make mistakes, I'd be lying. <laughs> 